isn't it odd how one series in a franchise can define a console generation, but have its successor barely heard? The Mass Effect trilogy, releasing between 2007 and 2012, was part of the most popular video games of their time. But Andromeda couldn't even make a lasting impression. It is true that making a spin-off of a popular franchise rarely makes the coveted lightning strike twice. The science fiction saga, with its action-packed gameplay, struck a delicate balance between RPG and cover-based shooting, and, perhaps, came out just when the time was right. The original trilogy is, to this day, still looked upon with a lot of love and nostalgia. A reminder that, in the past, the future looked brighter. Since Andromeda spectacularly crashed like an overhyped SpaceX test rocket, Bioware decided to put the franchise on hiatus, at least for a while. The studio turned its attention to a new sci-fi IP that, just like Mass Effect, had to blow everyone's mind. But unlike Mass Effect, Anthem couldn't break the mold. Fuck off with the spam invites. What do you want? After two poorly received games, it was time for the studio to reflect and start looking at the past. Dragon Age 4, the long-awaited sequel to Bioware's last successful game, has been in the work for a long time now and the studio decided to take Mass Effect back out of the freezer. A full-fledged sequel is currently in development, although we should not expect it anytime soon. In the meantime, however, we can look forward to the Mass Effect Legendary Edition, which will finally upgrade the trilogy to today's standards. Unfortunately, this small YouTuber doesn't have any footage to show you other than the trailers and GameSpot and IGN comparisons you're currently seeing in the background. My channel is just too small to be a bigger part of this franchise. That is why I'm asking you to hit that like button, click that subscribe button, and smash that notification bell. Would really help out a small YouTuber like myself. I am about 300 people away from getting a thousand subscribers, which is the goal I've set for this year. But enough about me, let's move on. Fans have been asking for a remaster for some time now, and even Bioware themselves have had the idea for a while. In recent years, there has been a pitch for a remake or remaster within Bioware, but it was only a year and a half ago that the remaster was greenlit after a small team had first explored the various options. Remakes and remasters come in all shapes and sizes. There are simple ports that make games ready and playable for modern devices and give a small boost to resolution and frame rates. While careful remasters polish where needed, add new effects and improve accessibility. And then there are full-fledged remakes that rebuild the game from the ground up. However, it soon became clear to Bioware that the Legendary Edition simply couldn't be a remake. The games and their characters are simply too popular for that. Any fundamental change, such as the change given to Final Fantasy VII, was deemed too offensive for the fans. And Bioware was right. Mass Effect and its characters are just too personal for many of us. This choice didn't come as a surprise, because in the trilogy, Bioware perfected its branching storytelling style, where you could influence the fate of Commander Shepard and his team through difficult choices. In short, fans want to relive the story of their Commander Shepard, as they can remember it through their rose-tinted nostalgia glasses. This means that Bioware has to strike a difficult-to-reach balance between unconditional loyalty to the source material and improvements where necessary. In search of that balance, Bioware played with the idea of developing the remaster with the Unreal 4 engine, in order to make full use of its latest graphics. But the studio soon abandoned that plan because the transition would be too laborious. By sticking to the engine that helped shape the trilogy, Bioware saved themselves a lot of time and effort. But that did not spare the development of major challenges. During the development of the trilogy, Bioware also created its own tools to realize its ambitions. And most of the people who made those tools, well, they've left Bioware. The remaster therefore became somewhat of an archaeological mission for Bioware, in which they had to dig into the history of both the games and the company itself. And not only that, they had to relearn how to use what they found. And just as archaeologists first start in the topsoil layers and only gradually dig deeper into older periods of time, 
so did Bioware work their way around the remaster. Bioware started with remastering Mass Effect 3, the youngest and therefore most modern feeling game of the three. By first polishing up the final piece of the trilogy, Bioware created a benchmark that the other two games had to meet. The idea is to get the three games to the same level as much as possible, so that playing the trilogy becomes an almost seamless experience. The best example of this is the new character creator that is now shared by all three titles. This ensures that you transfer not only your narrative choices, but also your version of Commander Shepard. For example, the design of the character's standard female incarnation, affectionately named Femshep, was only made in Mass Effect 3, but is now also a basic option for Mass Effect 1 and 2. Furthermore, Bioware did everything in its power to bring the options in the character creator in line with today's expectations. More than ever will you be able to design a Shepard in which you can identify yourself with. The models of many of the side characters that Shepard recruits are now more consistent throughout the trilogy. In doing so, Bioware made sure that their appearance still reflects the development that they go through as a character. Liara, for example, is still naive and innocent in Mass Effect 1, which is made apparent by her sober choices of clothing. However, in the Shadow Broker DLC storyline for Mass Effect 2, she has grown into someone with a lot more confidence, and that is what she radiates most in her Mass Effect 2 appearance. The games are also graphically more consistent with each other. No one will think that the trio of games was developed recently, but the graphical leap forward is significant nonetheless. The lighting effects are a bit more realistic, the details of certain characters and objects have been boosted, and the general image is a lot sharper. Bioware also saw the opportunity to implement modern techniques that were not available at the time, such as subsurface scattering, for example a technique where light is diffused through transparent material, leading to more realistic looking skin. Ambient occlusion is another technique they've added, where the degree of exposure is calculated depending on how much light an object catches and reflects, creating more vivid lighting. Nowhere is the difference more apparent than in Mass Effect 1, which of course left the most room for improvement. Although Bioware's were allegiance to the originals, they allow themselves more freedom in the case of the first game. For example, the levels in the original were often large, but also bare. Sometimes this worked in the game's favor, traversing the landscape of a planet gave the game a feel of tangible bigness that was missed in Mass Effect 2's narrow corridor shooting. But due to the sparse decor, some inhospitable planets acquired an unnatural beauty. Just as often they looked flat and bare, meaning they couldn't stimulate our imagination. Bioware retains the layout of the levels in the remaster, but has given them a new layer of digital paint. For example, by adding fog, weather effects, and extra vegetation, everything looks fuller and more realistic. In some levels, the changes are even more drastic. Eden Prime, for example, has its lighting system completely revamped to make the world less flat and monotonous. Originally, the sun was behind you as you traversed the level. But now you walk towards the sun, constantly seeing god rays breaking through the clouds and leaves. This also makes the departure of Sovereign look a lot more impressive. Not only does Mass Effect 1 get the biggest graphical changes, the gameplay will also be heavily adjusted to be in line with the other installments. It may be the only game of the three that comes the closest to a full-fledged remake, and with good reason. Anyone who played the original after playing Mass Effect 2 and 3 will have noticed how rough that first adventure was. Bioware was clearly still looking for the right balance between RPG and action adventure. Many additions from the later games feel like they're missing in retrospect. For example, in the Legendary Edition, a melee button has been added to Mass Effect 1. This was missing in the original and is now in line with Bioware's aim to equalize the control scheme across all three games. The use of certain weapon types are also no longer linked to your chosen class. Anyone can now use any weapon, although certain training modules are still reserved for certain classes. Because the balance between RPG and shooter was often lost in Mass Effect 1, the action often felt rough. Bioware is therefore adjusting the entire combat system. Whether a shot hits your target or not will no longer be decided by the roll of a dice. No longer will you see a bullet skim past a perfectly sighted skull. The infamous Mako has also been taken care of. 
many of Mass Effect fans still suffer Vietnam flashback experiences from the clunky controls, slow speed, and bouncy shopping cart physics. Fortunately, Bioware has firmly lined the controls of the Mako, updated the physics, added a speed boost button, and gave the camera more oversight. In the other titles, the changes are rather limited. Mass Effect 2 is virtually left untouched in terms of content, while Mass Effect 3 is sadly going to lack the multiplayer. Because the Galactic Readiness Rating, which had to be high enough for the best ending, depended on your performance in multiplayer, that system has now been rebalanced. Anyone who plays the entire trilogy from start to finish will now have enough readiness to get the best ending in Mass Effect 3. I, for one, will miss the multiplayer. It's one of the reasons why my YouTube channel got as big as it is now. A lot of my subscribers came here from my Mass Effect Andromeda build videos, and I'm sad to disappoint them. Apart from lacking the multiplayer in Mass Effect 3, Mass Effect 1 will also be lacking one DLC, Pinnacle Station. Apparently, the code for Pinnacle Station got corrupted and became unsalvageable, and rebuilding that DLC from the ground up would take additional months to complete. We doubt whether or not Pinnacle Station or the multiplayer will be missed by many fans. Pinnacle Station was very grindy and boring, and when it comes to the multiplayer, Bioware knows that Mass Effect has always been about its immersive single-player experience, and it promises to be better than ever in the Legendary Edition. And thank you so much for watching, and if you want to see more gaming news, reviews, previews, and release roundups, be sure to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell so that you never miss another upload. And I'll see you when I see you. That's awesome.